Someone once asked me, why do I often smile? I say, because uh, life might just give you lemon, but I, Elizabeth, will always find a way of making sure that I make my lemons lemonade. That way I get to be happy inside and outside and ready up with good health. Now, citizens of Nigeria, have we tried to do the same? Or are we always complaining? And in that complaint, are you doing your own part? Are you sure you're not part of the problem? That would be our trust. A lot of times we seem to complain and laws have been made, beautiful laws, all of that. What is left of us? We all blame it on enforcement. Who is the enforcer? You are part of it. There are people who are maybe traditionally, you know, given the vest as enforcers. But do you know that you and I are also enforcers? We go outside of this climb and we enjoy the beautiful scenario. We keep law and order. But once we come into Nigeria, it is back home, home sweet home. That should be the song. But sometimes we hear home bitter home, lawlessness, and lack of enforcement is our focus for today's uh, edition of Conversations. I've already told you, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm generally a talker. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Coach Didi, and I'm a mental health advocate. Mm -hmm. My name is Chuk Sakamadu, uh, President Center for Ethical Rebirth Among Nigerian Youths, Sirani for short. Okay. I'm pleased to be here. Sirani, uh, you know, you're very important. I know we are still expecting Ezra, uh, who will be joining us in the course of your program. Not Ezra, actually, Ola. And um, I know that you, being where you are, you have a lot of touch with the youth. I'm going to find out a lot of things, you know, from you as the program go on. But um, someone shared his story with us. He said um, he's a civil servant and has gone from place to place. But let me not empty it. Let's see what uh, Rufus' story is like. My name is Rufus. I was employed in the Federal Civil Service in my small village where I was born and bred. Um, two years later, I was transferred to a city nearby. I was thrilled with the thoughts of moving and living in a city. I moved. But within a few weeks, I wanted to go back to the peace and order in my village. In the city, everyone was in a hurry at all times. Cars at top speed, causing accidents and road obstruction. The seemingly tired road were all covered with death from people. People were aggressive to one another and fought at little offense. The police raids arrest and rough handle citizens at their own whim. Hmm. Lots of chaos everywhere, even in my city office. I wondered if I will ever love civilization, judging from what I see. As a federal worker, moving is inevitable. So five years later, I was transferred again. This time to the nation's capital. I was elated. I was confident that I will hug civilization and its orderliness as we were taught in school. True, there were lots of beautiful places, beautiful houses, smoothly tarred roads with street lights. But I observed again the lawlessness of my fellow citizens. Refuse were heaped and overflown at almost every frontage. Breeding bacterial and infection, drivers ply the road like crazy, jumping almost every red light. Taxis park in the middle of the road to pick or drop passengers, obstructing traffic. Too many important people live in this capital, and all move with siren, as if they were all dead bodies or with medical emergency. The worst I have seen 
is the way the law enforcers break the law. It is with impunity. In my village, where I come from, our king and all his chiefs, they lead by example. <laughs> but in these civilized places, uh, the reverse is the case. I'm not sure I want to be civilized anymore, but I'm told that our Nigerian civilization is different from the Western civilization. How then did we acquire our own? Any hope for us to get better? I wish um, everybody was right in the studio watching reactions as that story went on. We're all dead. Like everybody has um, been, you know, confronted, experienced, you know, that young boy's or young man's story one way at one point or the other. Or, okay, you just joined us. I, I don't want you to introduce, introduce yourself. <laughs> Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Right. My name is Dr. Lai Fatime. Okay. Uh, I'm a lecturer with the Department of Theatre and Performing Arts, Bayer University, Kano. All right, thank you for joining us. Yeah. And uh, I, you're also in the school system. I'm going to start later with you, but let me go to uh, Coach Didi here. That story, what's your take out? Honestly, I think it's basically what we all think about most of the time. This is what we think about, this is how we feel. And we leave it just at that. We feel it, we're thinking, we think it, but we don't take action. When he was talking, I was thinking of myself as a person, and I believe I've always wanted change. I've always believed that change begins with me, and I try as much as possible to follow rules and regulations. But once in a while, we all falter, you know. I remember the first time I was stopped at the traffic at somewhere around Utako. I honestly didn't know there was the, there was a tra traffic warden there, and I had passed. And then when he stopped me, I stopped, and I panicked. And then he came in. He asked me for my Particulars, I gave him my driver's license, and of course, yeah, you know, I just play ball. I've always told myself, I don't give right. I just did what? Play ball, as far as uh, find something. Football match or something. My sister, find something for the boys. Oh. Honestly, it went against everything I believe in. This is five years ago, five, six years ago. That was the first time in my life I gave money. Oh, you gave? I did. And wow. I'm saying it. I did give it. And I went back home. I couldn't sleep because I felt guilty. I had always preached against it, yet I did it. And I think that's because I honestly don't like to come from with this holier than that attitude. Because most of the time when we talk about things like this, they, 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 we are they. We are the people. We are Nigerians. Nigeria is what it is today because of all of us and our part in it. And I think it's time we take responsibility for what we do. And it's not just about talking. Let's walk the talk, really. Okay, I notice your monetary summary, but I want to ask a question directly. Maybe we all have um, a different opinion. I've been thinking, you know, I keep saying sometimes in my mind, I wish I had owned um, a tipa or a trailer. I'll become, you know, a driver of trailer or trailer out or tipa, you know, be moving around the, the city. Those who break rules, I crush them, you know. Yeah, I can't do it with my small car because it's all fiber to push me off the road. Mm -hmm. But I keep wondering, why do Nigerians break law? Let me start with you. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for the question. You see, the thing is, there is so much impunity and ineptitude around. Nigerians break the law because they can. They can? Yeah. That's why, because... Uh, there is no mechanism that is directly in place to checkmate excesses, you know. And I share with the pains of, especially this traffic issue, people just do whatever they want to do and get away with it because there is no mechanism in place to ensure that that doesn't happen. So Nigerians break the law because they can break the law. Without consequences. Yes, and nothing happens. You know, the the worst that can happen is uh, they take you to the station. Maybe you pay, you you bribe your way out, and and that is it. You know, and once that room is there, people will exploit it. But if the mechanism is put in place, and then you know that you cannot just do whatever you want to do and get away with it, you won't break the law. 
that is why you find Nigerians in Nigeria breaking the law. But when they go out there and they know that they cannot get away with it, they abide by the rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. popular. Yeah. So, you know, do you know who I am? <laughs> do you know who I am? Yeah. That is just yeah. reckless yeah. impunity. Yeah. Reckless I hear, I hear impunity. there a lot. Yes. I hear but, there a lot. But, but I think um, uh, to uh, uh, distinct issues were lumped together mm -hmm. in that um, uh, documentary we just watched. Uh, well, uh, on the one part, uh, I think uh, that video we, ju we just seen betrays. Uh, realities of urbanization uh, comparing apple no, uh, no ranges wouldn't work because our rural communities still uh, maintain some uh, semblance of order semblance of sanity and all of that but in our urban centers let us grant i mean it's a, a universal phenomenon the pressures of life are more intense in urban centers. So it explains in large parts why the animal part of us seem to come out a lot more often. Having said that, uh, we shouldn't also look at this issue as something that is peculiar to our own environment. It is not. Because even the concept of law and order and all of that didn't come from us as a society. Again, it's something that is universal. In every society, why you have law in place is because of the likelihood of people doing the wrong thing. So, uh, uh, people break the law everywhere. Everywhere. Go to United States of America, go to all parts of Africa, if you go to issue, in Asia, if you go to Europe and all of that. But I guess what makes us a bit peculiar is weak or absence of enforcement that's what really uh, uh marks us out as being different again uh governor uh, govern uh governance as far as i'm concerned is supposed to be a contractual relationship between those in authority and those uh and the governed if that be the case then uh, enforcement shouldn't only be left in the hands of law enforcement agents or agencies, as it were. Uh, the citizens also have a role to play because all of this is a reflection of our cultural beliefs, reflections of our accepted norms, the things that our society can, uh, can tolerate and all of that. If from the very beginning at the family unit, at the church level, at the mosque level, uh, traditional institutions, religious institutions uh, frown at uh, breaking of laws and getting away uh, with it. I am sure we would have done a lot better, but there's just something wrong somewhere with our value system, our culture as a people that permits people to commit offenses and then walk away with it. You know, um, I beg to differ a little bit, yeah. you know, from what you said when it comes to uh, our cultural beliefs and yeah. religious beliefs because I know that to a large extent I've studied there, I may be a Christian, but I've studied the Islamic religion to a very great value. I know that there is no way it supports immorality, disobedience, you know, lack of respect and all of that. Uh, same as Christian. And then moving down to the traditional religion, which at least every one of us has uh, one way or the other, you know, been part of. There is still no way. In fact, at a point, people were saying that uh, if governments, if uh, government people are taking oath, they should swear not by the you know the foreign books of God, but our traditional books, because somehow it has a way of following immediately when you break the law. So that's to tell you the gravity of what is obtainable in the traditional religion. So I know that in the traditional settings, which is why perhaps the young man said that he prefers to go back to the village. If you commit a crime, everybody knows who is who and is taken care of instantly. The punishment is given to you. Back in the days, they used to, you were not born there, some of us were born there. <laughs> they used to, <laughs> you know, put people on exile. They banished people for committing crime. So there was enforcement. And I know up until now, most villages, there are still enforcement. Chiefs are still working. Traditional rulers are still working. It's only a lot of times found in, this, in the city these things happen what breaks my heart is 
I don't understand when the law enforcement agents, I'm not calling a particular person, you know, are the ones breaking law. There was a clip we saw here, it happened not long ago in Lagos State. A particular enforcers were driving one way. And it makes me ask, are there people who are above the law? You're the lecturer. <laughs> well, it is assumed that um, uh, everybody is equal before the law. I mean, that is the assumption. Yeah. And the law recognizes that as long as you are a human person, you are an institution, you are under the law of whatever state you find yourself. But again, I keep going back to this impunity. He spoke about the peculiarity of our lawlessness you know and the fact that it is a it is a common thing anywhere you go people break the law yeah of course there, there is a natural tendency for people to break the law mm -hmm. that is why rules laws are put in place in the first place yeah. because the natural inclination you have is to defy right but we put laws in place to ensure that there is sanity you know there is no anarchy and all that but who enforces the law just like you mentioned even those who are given charge to enforce the law are even the breakers of the law and this is again because of the impunity and inept the only difference between the the street urchin for instance and the person wearing the uniform is the uniform the orientation is still the same that you can you can do short practice you can do whatever you want to do and get away with it right but the person for instance if you check the law may not even have the right to pursue in the first place you know but he pursues somebody and moves to the uh, to to the other lane and in in the name of in the line of duty but if you check it, it, it that's already breaking the law you also mentioned something about hoping that you will be able to get a trailer or a lorry to bulldoze people along the road. It is, again, a reflection of that lawlessness in us. Because you know, it is not your job to do that. Yes. Uh -huh. But because nobody is doing it, or, it. or it appears that nobody <laughs> yeah. is doing it, you want to take the law into your hands and bully people to obey the law. <laughs> right? But I think it's a major problem that we all admit is lack of consequences. That's the truth. People get away with blue murder in this country. You can do virtually anything and get away with it if you know the right people or you have enough cash. And that's the mindset even our kids have today. Hmm. Even the children believe it. They so, believe you can. That something happened yesterday and my son said something about, I, there's, there's a way we can go around it. Hmm. That's the mindset of Nigerians. There's always a way to go around it. So it's us as a people. It's our mindset. You know, he said something about culture. You, you said something about culture? Yes. As a people, every person is made up of three things. Your upbringing, it influences the kind of person you are, the environment you grew up in, and then significant emotional events that have happened in your life. It all shapes how we think. So no matter where you work, those who enforce the law, they also are, they have mindsets. And their peculiarities, things that have happened to them, shapes the way they think. So they will make mistakes. Them making mistakes is part of life. Who doesn't make mistakes? I just admitted on air, I have made a mistake. And in fact, that's not, that wasn't the only time, actually. That's not the only one. I think I made another one. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. And, and I think that's, I, I need, we need to be able to accept that we have made mistakes. Because we cannot move forward if we keep pretending. Because we are the people. You know, um, when we talk about law, enforcement, abiding by it, and all of that, a lot of times it's a hit on the youth. You're their champion. <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, you see... Do we all agree that um, culture is the totality of the will of a people? Yeah. If we agree that culture is the totality of the will of a people, it means laws are a subset of our culture. See, have you bothered to ask yourself why corruption has continued to persist in this country? It's, we have all the beautiful laws. We have law enforcement. But the truth of the matter is that the extant traditional beliefs the norms of the people have continued to nurture corruption you convict someone today you successfully catch a thief and get him convicted and the person returns to his village and they confer on him a chief title, title. Yes. that's what i'm talking about we need a total overhaul of our value system you sound as though you do not realize that the 
law enforcement officer do does not function in isolation. He's an integral part of the society. So consciously and unconsciously, we are all part of this yeah. rotten system. Yeah. That's why we really have to do something about this. It's not about law. The police officer, the soldier, the uh, the FCC person, the ICP person, they come from homes, they come from mm -hmm. communities and all of that. And it's because the society somehow tolerates this. That's why you see these things happening. So if we must overcome lawlessness in this country, then it must... Uh, it means that all of us will have to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement, uh, law enforcement people, the, uh, the individual, uh, traditional institutions, religious institutions. Like I said earlier, we all have roles to play so that we can reset this country and become a law, uh, law abiding, uh, law abiding people. If this thing cannot happen. It, it has very little to do with the letters of the law. In any event, even the constitution, you know, that's the supreme law of the land, right? Mm -hmm. But I can assure you, uh, from the legal point of view the constitution derives its validity from the spirit of the people that backs it in the absence of our subscribing to the written words of the constitution it becomes a worthless paper that's why we even have so many laws today that we are we've not even tested that we don't give a hoot about so it's not just about the laws it's about the norms the value system of the society we all have to realize that there has to there is need for us to reorientate ourselves there is need for us to reevaluate where we are coming from and see how we can all join us to make nigeria a better place definitely we will do that and that's uh, the essence of the conversation we're having but i am not um, batting my eyes against the question i earlier took to you are the youth the major culprits you work with them well if you're talking about the youth i i think they should even be excused to a large extent, of though, uh, uh, well, it shouldn't be excused quite all right. You, I mean, if you break the law, you should face the law. Consequences. Uh, yes, the consequences. But I say so because it, how would you blame the youth? They learn from the yeah. adults. Yes. They are just okay. victims of what is happening at the moment. If you look at most of the government policies we have today, how often do government and its agencies reach out to the youth to ask them to make input into plans and these plans have to do with the future and who owns the future is the youth so you often find them rebelling because they are functionally excluded from the scheme of things so i think that the parents the older generation to take a larger chunk of the blame of course that does not mean that the youth are at liberty to do as they like in any event, I think they have a sacred obligation to ensure that things are done differently because it is their future that is at stake and not that of their parents. But at the end of the day, um, some people, you say you are quite agree with me, yeah. but I'll just throw this where you pick up from your agreement or disagreement. Some youths really, they tag them, the Gen Z, yeah. the millennia generation. generation. I don't know if some of the people who are older could be classified as that. You know, in Nigeria, youths can extend up to 60 years, you know. So these people, sometimes where you're talking to them, they are refuting. They stand adamantly on a particular view. And this view seemingly is not you know, suitable for them. Sometimes you ask them their role models. They are mentioning people, you know, who have uh, imbibed money acquired money through fraudulent uh, means they are not looking at those people who have made names and do not have wealth those who may not have been famous but they have um, a, a kind of a clear name to attach to themselves are this also to be blamed on the elders yes i think everything is blamed on us as, uh, as parents because see like he said the culture is part of us law is part of the culture a society is made up of units and that the smallest unit in society is a family so every person every human being terrorist saint they all came from a family if parents took their role seriously the truth is that most of the time there's no intentional parenting people become parents but they are not parents they are not being parents becoming a father and being a father are two different things becoming a mother and being a mother are two different things sure. most people just become father and mother but being that it takes hard work. It takes discipline. That's why self-discipline is key here. How can you discipline a child when you don't have self-discipline yourself? How can you raise a child to have values, to understand what is right and what is wrong when you do not practice what is right or what is wrong yourself? 
most like I said earlier, most of the time we talk and talk and talk. We need to start walking the talk. Because kids see what we do, not what we say. And I think that's basically key. Okay, um, in the university, mm. there are rules, there are you know, laws abiding. The parents are not there. What's the scenario like? Uh, well, for, for universities, probably because of the, the size, right? Um, every student belongs to a department. Every student, like from the university I come from, every student has um, a level coordinator who is charged with the responsibility of guiding, you know, and then ensuring that the student does what is expected. But beyond that, you see, we cannot absolve society, really. From, yeah, let me ask you a question. Yes. The level advisors or guidance, mm, like you mentioned, yeah. they are supposed to guide them even outside of um, academic, you know, academic, work. academic work. It's only academic, academic work. Unless, about, unless, uh, unless academic the student work. mentions something outside of academic work. Okay, so it's not really full-time. It's not, not full-time mentoring. Oh, okay. It's academic. Okay. Right? Unless the student opens up to discuss other matters with you, but your responsibility basically is academic okay. with the student. Okay. Yes. But I was talking about absolving uh, society. You see, some of us were raised uh, to fit into a society that no longer be, uh, no longer exists. You know, where our parents were strict. Okay, making sure that we only do that which is right, and then you go out there and you find out the person who wants to do the right thing is the odd one out. Yeah, you are the odd one out. Every other person is cutting corners and then you are the one insisting that, you no, know, what should be has to be. Mm -hmm. And then you now appear like you are in a world that is, that it no longer exists, right? And then you spoke about the Gen Z. Uh, she mentioned something very important, which is that being a parent is different from becoming a parent. This gener Gen Z, Generation Z, they are literally vicariously raising themselves up yeah. the, the 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 internet is the parent okay so whatever trends whatever things that are happening in the world out there it is the internet that is training them mm -hmm. and when they see somebody do one shady deal and become a billionaire because the the orientation now is everything you do is around money the value of having humanity at heart is no longer there is what you can make right and this is the lavish lifestyle that the internet uh shows is what everybody wants to have i was watching uh something on the internet just last night that uh, two boys 17 15 went to a car stand and stole a car you know in the name of they wanted to buy it they want to drive test and they, they moved away with it two days ago only for them to be caught yesterday. You understand? And this, these people have parents. But these parents are busy trying to survive in a society that is man eats man, I mean dog eat dog. You know, everybody just wants to accumulate. Nobody has time to raise people in the values that everybody keeps talking about. What are the values? They have changed. Can I add something? Yeah. You see, you said something. Two boys, 17 and 15, went to buy a car. Yeah. Mm. For God's sake, the person How selling the selling, car. I was going to say that. The person selling the it's, car will actually listen to two boys. And he act, and believe me, if they paid money, he will collect of the course money. He will, of course he will take it. I'll tell you what happened to um, somebody quite recently. She needed to learn how to drive. She went to a driving school, registered properly, and um, went through the tutelage for, uh, was it six weeks or so? At the end of the day, they told uh, um, her that she needed to do the ICT, computer-based test. She said, okay. On a given day, she, the man called her and said, if you're too busy, um, somebody can write it for you, but you'll pay 3000 She said, no, I need to do it myself. She went there. They opened up. There were some other people. A lady came out, was walking around the place and uh, dropping answers for them you know she probably picked from whatever she said or she did not but she finished her stuff and when she was like this is wrong why are you doing this because she said to herself driving it's a question of your life and other people's life yeah. Yeah. so she needed to do it right you know at the end of the day she was going home 
the lady called her back you haven't paid paid what uh, the answers i was given you were supposed to give uh, give us money for it she said no i didn't solicit for answer i never even some of your answers i didn't even listen to what you were saying i wrote my thing if you needed to give out answers to people you should have asked me to my you know uh, disgust the owner the assistant owner of the place so to say she said also said yes that's the norm that uh, this person come in to help you because these exams are hard you know she did not pay one hour she left and i said take me to the place i want to go and uh, make investigation i'm still on it because this happened quite recently yeah. I, I need to follow it to the end because i will get a uh, uh, federal road safety involved because they should you know uh, stamp out yeah. such uh, training centers because if that child does not get well she's going to get on the road break rules yeah. and, and when she drives someone. wrongly it could kill me it could yeah. kill you it could kill anybody we know so by then talking about traffic and all of that i i would like to know from uh, uh attorney here what is the law on siren use of siren because i'm kind of confused i don't know any day i have gone out and driven the shortest distance three minutes there's always siren harassing me you know the other day about here where we call jaga they were like almost in my front and my back. I was confused. I, I stopped my car in the middle of the road. Well, the regulations, of course, prohibit uh, uh, indiscriminate use of uh, sirens. Uh, if you use siren in a case of medical emergency, of course, it's understandable. It wasn't an ambulance. It wasn't a medical emergency. Okay. It was fleet of cars, black. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. With a white, uh, a white um, pickup. Of course, it's because uh, our society has become captive in the hands of our elite. Yeah. That's why they keep oppressing and suppressing us. Ordinarily, our leaders should lead by example. They are not supposed to be polluting the environment the way they do with reckless abandon. They are supposed to be role models. And as role models, they should learn how to lead and conduct themselves in a very decent, modest and respectable way manner how do you now expect the young people to behave differently you see that thing that we're saying is because our so-called leaders are very very fond of abusing their privileges they ordinarily should be our servants but the reverse is the case so when they i think i like that because i pay their salary of course but that's the truth mm -hmm. they are actually our employees they are they, yeah they're supposed to be our, they're our uh, employees but the reverse is the case because this is africa so it now like i said we are now captives in their hands that's why they do that to us they are not supposed to be doing that obeying rules obeying regulations such as traffic laws and all of that should be something that they consider very very key in the discharge of their duties because they are people that are looked up to do you understand the eyes of the people are upon them but you see when they begin to abuse such privileges it now because difficult for us to blame the younger ones who also want to be like them. So whether or not they're in position of authority, the moment they make money from Yahoo Yahoo from whatever unlawful manner, the next thing they want to do is to buy SUV cars, buy get fleet of cars yeah. and also and put their revolver lights and make sure that also do like the leaders because they want to be accepted in society because they think it really is that those people are accepted in the society they also seek validation yeah. so since siren blaring is what validates a man that Big has man. Uh, yes, man that, yes that, that that validates a man that has come of age that has arrived then you go for it it's can funny. i add something here go yeah. ahead man. the eyes of the people is not upon them the eyes of the people is on their pockets let's be honest they don't look up to them as like uh, like somebody to uh, role models most people who have acquired something or made something of their lives, people around them beg them. They don't see them as an example. Like that. Mm -mm. It's what they can get from them. You see, I think that's why Nigeria, oh, no, I, said, I think I'm buying into politics. Because, <laughs> honestly, to change, because to change mindset, because most people, you have a brother, you have an uncle, you have someone you know who has become something, he has become a governor, he has become a minister. The first thing you do is give him a list of demands. Now imagine he has a hundred relatives. That is being very modest. 
and each of them sends a list. If your child gives birth, his child gives birth, or he's, he's, he, he has a new birth, he will call that same minister. If his child is going to school, he calls the minister. When there's no food in his house, he calls the same so minister. So in that situation, who do you blame? I blame society again. Lack of self-discipline. No! You also forget that the minister in question has deliberately disempowered that, uh, that uh, his, dependent, his dependent economically. How? So making the perpetual... Of course, if we are to judiciously use the resources of this country you would have found that so many people would have been in power they wouldn't have had need to be parasites and indeed leeches on these our leaders it's because the leaders know that the only way they can retain the loyalty of the followers is to make sure that they remain perpetually poor so when you find yourself in such a vulnerable situation i can assure you that you have little or no option Little or no option. Pray you don't find yourself in such a uh, vulnerable uh, situation. And that is why leadership, again, is key. We need to have the right kind of leadership to ensure that our resources are evenly distributed. People have opportunities. There are so many people who are doing lots of uh, unlawful things that they ordinarily wouldn't have loved to do. But circumstances that they could not handle at a particular time push them into nefarious activities. So does that mean as long as society is not what the ideal society we want, everybody can do as they please? No! It's a, see, it's, uh, the evolution of uh, a, a nation state is, uh, is a continuum. We need to strive to continually better our environment. In terms of laws, observance of laws, law enforcement, and indeed preserving our society, because this is the only space that we've got. We should consciously strive to better our place at all times, because if the roof is leaking as it is at the moment, everybody's suffering. So we cannot pull down the roof. All we owe ourselves as responsible citizens is to find a way of fixing the roof. And if the roof keeps leaking, we'll keep fixing it. You know, the whole idea of this conversation is, um, you know, to point out the areas we're airing. Like she observed, we talk about uh, law enforcement. And I mentioned earlier, too, that all of us are enforcers one way or the other. We yeah. may not be wearing uniform, yeah. but we are all enforcers. In our workplaces, we see things go wrong. We do not, you know, condemn it and try to stamp it out. We have uh, favorites staff we have favorite children and we go wrong we turn uh, you know no, no, no. that eye the other way and do, those things continue if there is no equity in the treatment continuously things will go wrong my question is you talked about the salary and i'm very particular about the road i'm very particular because apucha is just crazy you cannot, when I said we should try and see if we can get shots of bad places, we didn't need to move from place to place. So we just stood one place and in 30 minutes we got all that we needed because there was police breaking, jumping red lights. There was a VIO jumping red lights. But those ones, they have there right. was, they have rights. Which rights? Oh no, because they're uniform now. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> there was FLCN. Um, FRC, you know, driving without seat belts. As a matter of fact, I actually, you know, teased one of them. I said, "Where is your seat seat belt?" And he looked at me and slashed Smile. it. You know, I had to remind him. You know, there were ordinary people doing the same. As a matter of fact, we got to a place where there was traffic. I don't want to mention areas really, where there was traffic, and that siren was right behind. And I was like, "Let's see how this man is going to jump." And we got down, one of us went down, and tried to walk around. It wasn't medical emergency, it was an ordinary citizen. And he kept trying to meander to find a way to move the, uh, the place. That wasn't an ordinary citizen. Ordinary citizens don't go around with siren. That's an ordinary citizen. <laughs> okay. That's my employee, as a matter of fact. So we, uh, we, it was a bit funny, and we tried to you know, rub minds with uh, people like you and I on the road. Nobody liked it. My question is, if I see a law enforcer breaking the law, what should I do within the ambience of law? Well, within the ambience of the law, if you see a law enforcement uh, uh, say the right thing is to also report him to, uh, to, to the authorities, to well, higher authorities, because of course they, of course they have uh, uh, mechanisms for addressing such uh, uh, official misconduct and all of that. But again, it will depend on how 
well the person you're talking about is entrenched in the system if he's well entrenched if he's favored by his bosses i can assure you that that your complaints will go in vain <laughs> i think it's a mindset thing if we build it in us to have a mindset that when something is wrong we shouldn't ignore it we shouldn't look the other way we should do something it's now a choice now you're talking about patriotism yes now you're talking about patriotism you can have you can only have this uh level of patriotism if we have succeeded in getting nigerians to actually co-own the nigerian project if we co-own the nigerian project you will find that federal government wouldn't be spending so much money in policing our pipelines because it naturally should be the responsibility of members of each community to protect government facilities and infrastructure that is located within their domain. And we are the people. Yeah, and we should we each are take the people. It means for federal government to be spending so much money protecting our pipelines means that the community themselves yeah. they They're are failing. complicit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I let me go back to another thing that happens. You know, um, two days ago, the Queen of England was buried. I actually took my time to watch the burial. There were a lot of people, you know, on the queue. When they were ready, when, were, when she was lying in state, people were going to, you know, Can see her. I noticed all the leaders, heads of uh, nations came, uh, the prime minister was there, everybody, and they queued up. Some stood for as long as one hour, as long as two hours to get to see, uh, they paid their final uh, uh, respect. In Nigeria, why do we often jump queues at little, even when there is no reason for it? You know, when um, if I was, I was saying to myself, if that scenario played out in Nigeria, I Elizabeth would have been on the queue. I probably came by five a.m. so that I can get to have opportunity. Then somebody will wake up by nine and arrive at ten. Once the person arrives, they will tell Elizabeth to go back. So, so and so person has come and when he's passing he's going to carry all his entourage maybe like 20 of them they'll all go there before i go and by the time i'm waiting again possibly his wife or his daughter will come and they also tell me to shift why do we find it difficult to cure well you talked about i would like to take it from the queen elizabeth uh, the story you just shared with us you see if you look at the whole procession how oddly you would find that what was as beaten was the finest of British tradition. It was part of their national character to so conduct themselves. But not traditionally, we are also like that. So yeah, we we <coughs> were. We are. My understanding was that in the colonial days and years immediate, uh, immediately after uh, independence, there were a lot more oddly society. But at some point, a contract culture infiltrated our society. And that contract culture, which is inconsistent with our culture, appears to have overthrown yeah. our culture. That's why I was talking about an overhaul. That was why I was talking about a conscious effort on the part of the people and government of Nigeria. To reverse this trend, we first have to arrest the drift. Because we can't possibly continue like this because things are getting out of hand. We must get to a point where we we'll say enough it's is enough. enough and it has to be a collective effort. Now, there is a phrase he used that is very important, which is national character. You see, whether you leave it to chance or you do it consciously, every society will have that character. We are complaining today because our national character appears to be lawlessness. And this is because we are leaving it to chance. We are leaving it to people with the orientation that the, the, you have to be smart. You know, you have to be smart. And you have to be smart because it appears that nobody is watching. So you can get away with whatever you want to do. But national character has to be consciously instilled in the minds of people. Uh, what you saw at the uh, procession and then people waiting their turns for to there is this popular footballer david beckham yeah. uh, he is he's is even royalty they say 
but he was asked to jump queue and go and you know so that he could leave and he said no he would wait and he stood there for over two hours yes. waiting his turn yes. now in nigeria if you hear one big man is coming because you have been like he mentioned you have been robbed of the basic necessities you are now a dependent who is seeking to curry favors from people who are there to serve you you will go on your own to create an office where you will make room for that person so that when he comes he does not have to wait for anybody and then once he feels important you fall under the purview of his favors you know and that is the problem because everybody is literally hungry looking for something and because we have cornered the goodies of the of the of the society you need to do that to survive you know it's it's, it's, it's really sad. honestly i still don't agree it's, with that it's, about it's, the fact that we need to do something you know because if we keep saying society is what it is yes whoever costs it that's a different matter but if we keep saying simply because things are not working the way the society should be it's a reason for us to do what we do then society will not no. change, we change that that no 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 well i'm not saying that because our society is like this we have to continue that way i am saying that there are things that have made us move mm. from the value system we have always had to this do whatever you want and get away I with it. Urgently need a reversal. You understand? We reversal. So we that need. Means, yeah. If you go to the banks, you, you want to withdraw money. It's the same thing. There is a queue, and you, you want to show that yeah. uh, you at least you try. You'll be taken advantage queue. of. You stand in queue. Let me tell you. Somebody will come in. The worst is even a, a small place like shopping malls. Yes. yes. Somebody will come in. You probably did a weekend shopping, so your your cart is full. You wheel it to the place. You get to your turn. Somebody will come in. There are two ways they do it. Either they pretend like they don't know what they are doing. They drop their, then the cashier will pick it up, or they said, "Excuse me, I only have these two things. Now let me pay." And then the cashier will attend to the person. Once the one did it to me, I shop right. I told the person, "If you do that, I'm going to leave the whole." Lot. Was it a crime for me to buy plenty? Why should somebody jump out? Do you know what my own situation is? You know, you go to fuel stations, the same thing. The yeah. the people the worst is even the fuel attendants during yeah. the very heat period. Yeah, yeah. All the fuel attendants bought package sheets. Everybody became very <laughs> big on that. But I have good Nigerians have are good in the hurry for going us. nowhere. Okay. That is why we jump queues. We do for no reason, just so because we I can. have good news for us. It, 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 it's not a totally helpless situation. If you have observed, the average Nigerian is good. The average Nigerian wants order. The average Nigerian desires to lead a decent life. Uh, those who have brought us to this sorry pass and those who perpetuate this uh, unfortunate uh, situation we find ourselves, they are in the minority. That is a good thing, meaning that it's just a tiny minority that has foisted this thing on us. You will find that any day we resolve to disarm this bunch of i don't know uh, what to call them uh, uh, this bunch of people who are taking us on the wrong path you'll find that a whole lot of nigerians will embrace it take the take the electoral process for instance in 1999 we experienced ballot ballot uh, ballot box That's snatching true. and all of that did you see because nigerians had resolved to ensure that this democracy that they fought so hard to get, that they were not going to toy with it at all. Have you seen how the pressure has been on the government, both on the executive and the legislature? And if you look at our electoral laws, it's been witnessing constant Revolution. amendment, mm -hmm. constant amendment. And you find that people are getting a lot more excited about mm -hmm. our, mm -hmm. meaning that the solution to our problem is yeah. there. And okay. it's us. All right, so let's see if we can take one or two messages. We've been talking, I forgot that um, uh, people are also participating. I was like, oh, somebody says uh, his name is Christian Johnson. Uh, wow, I love this program. God bless you all. The little I say is the law of my country, Nigeria, is only written law, not practicing law, or is a law of favoritism. That is, the people in government only work with a law that only favors their interests. Um, I think um, a lot of us share this belief as well. And uh, somebody says, uh, I'm from Abakaleke, uh, Kafas. 
It says it's untrained skill, unprofessional for an official of the law to break or violate the law in the name of catching the law breaker. Again, I drove in a city of Abakaleke in a Boeing state. There is no designated bus stop, no, nor, uh, okay, there are most busy roads. Yes, the prosecuted drivers for, you know, carrying passengers, four stations, is never a bus stop okay i guess the foil stations are used as bus stops at the end of the day the law enforcers catch them for not uh, stopping at bus stop meanwhile he's saying that there's no bus stop i hope the government of uh, abekeleke that's a bony state uh, you're watching and you do something about that we need to reject the society we need to reject the country another person is uh, asking question he says um, please have you gone through nigerian airports the people there should all <laughs> said they should evacuate everybody there that they are all criminals anyway <laughs> i guess that's his experience this is a campaign we're carrying on later on in the afternoon i know that uh, medley will still be taking an angle to this and i know that also by weekend weekend we will be talking about this it's a campaign and that's because all of us are pinned yeah. so we want to make sure we stamp it out just one sentence to say bye bye to nigerians i'll start with you Okay, well, my, my plea would be that um, we should be conscious about our, our environment and then we should be our brother's keeper mm -hmm. and um, we should insist that the right things are done and the idea that once you are the one doing the right thing, you are che being cheated, should okay. be changed. Okay, and I believe Nigeria is a collective responsibility. We should look within ourselves, mm -hmm. take responsibility for our own actions first okay. and then try to enforce. All right. Well, for me. Let's start from our individual selves. Whatever you think is wrong, don't do it. Uh, whatever you think is right, please start with yourself first. All right. Um, uh, the word of uh, God from different books says that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. So if you go with that, at the end of the day, somebody is asking me chapter one. Well, <laughs> chapter <laughs> is the one you open up. Any book you open up, it tells you that love yourself, love your neighbors, and show love to everyone. Don't forget that um, if you point this finger, there are several others facing you. And that means that all of us are called to let's change this nation. Bye for now.